Biology is the scientific study of life. It explores the diverse forms of living organisms, their structures, functions, interactions, and evolution. It encompasses everything from the tiniest microbes to the largest whales and examines life at various levels, from the molecular level to the ecosystem level. Biology is a broad and dynamic field with many subdisciplines, including botany, the study of plants, zoology, the study of animals, microbiology, the study of microorganisms, genetics, the study of heredity and genes, ecology, the study of the relationships between organisms and their environment, physiology, the study of the functions of living organisms and their parts. Now listen to part of a talk in a biology class. Now, as organisms adapted to life on land, they had to contend with several challenges in the terrestrial environment. Water has been described as the stuff of life. The cell's interior is a watery soup. In this medium, most small molecules dissolve, and the majority of the chemical reactions of metabolism take place. Drying out is a constant danger for an organism exposed to air. Even when parts of a plant are close to a source of water, the aerial structures are likely to dry out. Water also provides buoyancy to organisms. On land, plants need to develop structural support in a medium that does not give the same lift as water. The organism is also subject to radiation because air does not filter out ultraviolet rays of sunlight. Additionally, the male gametes, the male cell that is able to unite with the opposite sex in sexual reproduction, must reach the female gametes using new strategies, because swimming is no longer possible. The successful land plants developed strategies to deal with all of these challenges. Not all adaptations appeared at once. Some species never moved very far from the aquatic environment, whereas others went on to conquer the driest environments on Earth. Question. What does the professor imply about supporting plant life on land? Why does the professor say this? Water has been described as the stuff of life. Now listen to part of a talk in a biology class. Scientists use the term bioenergetics to describe the concept of energy flow through living systems, such as cells. Cellular processes, such as the building and breaking down of complex molecules, occur through stepwise chemical reactions. Some of these chemical reactions are spontaneous and release energy, whereas others require energy to proceed. Just as living things must continually consume food to replenish their energy supplies, cells must continually produce more energy to replenish that which is used by the energy-requiring chemical reactions that constantly take place. Together, all of the chemical reactions that take place inside cells, including those that consume or generate energy, are referred to as the cell's metabolism. Question. What is the professor mainly discussing? What is referred to as the cell's metabolism? Now listen to part of a talk in a biology class. The goal of homeostasis is the maintenance of equilibrium around a specific value of some aspect of the body or its cells called a set point. While there are normal fluctuations from the set point, the body's systems will usually attempt to go back to this point. A change in the internal or external environment is called a stimulus and is detected by a receptor. The response of the system is to adjust the activities of the system so the value moves back toward the set point. 
For instance, if the body becomes too warm, adjustments are made to cool the animal. If glucose levels in the blood rise after a meal, adjustments are made to lower them and to get the nutrient into tissues that need it. Now, when a change occurs in an animal's environment, an adjustment must be made so that the internal environment of the body and cells remain stable. The receptor that senses the change in the environment is part of a feedback mechanism. The stimulus, temperature, glucose, or calcium levels, is detected by the receptor. The receptor sends information to a control center, often the brain, which relays appropriate signals to an organ that is able to cause an appropriate change, either up or down, depending on the information the sensor was sending. Question. What is the lecture mainly about? Why does the professor mention glucose levels in the blood? Now listen to part of a talk in a biology class. Community dynamics are the changes in community structure and composition over time, often following environmental disturbances such as volcanoes, earthquakes, uh, storms, fires, and climate change. Communities with a relatively constant number of species are said to be at equilibrium. The equilibrium between species identities and relationships changes over time, but maintains a relatively constant number. Following a disturbance, the community may or may not return to the equilibrium state. Succession describes the sequential appearance and disappearance of species in a community over time after a severe disturbance. In primary succession, newly exposed or newly formed rock is colonized by living organisms. In secondary succession, a part of an ecosystem is disturbed and remnants of the previous community remain. In both cases, there is a sequential change in species until a more or less permanent community develops. Question. What is the lecture mainly about? Based on the information from the listening, indicate which characteristic on the left belongs to either primary succession or secondary succession. Now listen to part of a talk in a biology class. Adaptive immunity is defined by two important characteristics, specificity and memory. Specificity refers to the adaptive immune system's ability to target specific pathogens, and memory refers to its ability to quickly respond to pathogens to which it has previously been exposed. For example, when an individual recovers from chickenpox, the body develops a memory of the infection that will specifically protect it from the virus if it is exposed to it again later. Specificity and memory are achieved by essentially programming certain cells involved in the immune system to respond rapidly to subsequent exposures of the pathogen. This programming occurs as a result of the first exposure to a pathogen, which triggers a primary response. Later exposures result in a secondary response that is faster and stronger as a result of the body's memory of the first exposure. This secondary response, however, is specific to the pathogen in question. For example, exposure to one virus, like chickenpox, will not provide protection against other viral diseases. Question. Why is a secondary response faster and stronger than a primary response? Why does the professor say this? For example, 
exposure to one virus, like chickenpox, will not provide protection against other viral diseases.